We are living in times that are increasingly perilous, perilous in many ways, like our area is getting more perilous. And fear is definitely a reality that we are all contending with. And personally, we, I have gotten a lot more messages and calls about fearful. People are just really fearful and they want prayer to dismantle the fear. But I think that the news is not helping because there's so much hypothetical news that I just feel for people. But a serious reality is that fear appears in a list in Revelation 21 8 describing those who will be cast into a lake of fire. This is why I'm addressing it because there's a there's a part of the whole fear thing that needs to be clearly understood. And one thing in the assignment or the assigned role or the I don't want to um, probably the position that God has me in, I take very seriously, and that is to make some things clear. And this is one thing I want to make very clear. Revelation 21.8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death that is a horrendous warning to people i'm going to read the list of people again the cowardly the unbelieving the abominable murderers sexually immoral that's any sex out of the confines of marriage, including pornography, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. That would be someone who lies habitually. Shall have their part in the lake of fire, which is the second death. All who love iniquity, simply all who love iniquity, sin, have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. So if your salvation experience, your, your walk with Jesus has not caused you to hate sin. Something's terribly wrong with it. And you need to examine what it's rooted in because a relationship with Christ that matches the standard that's required for heaven will cause you to hate your sin. So anyone who still loves sin will have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And those who do such things as continuing in sin and this list of people shall not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning they are not going to go to heaven. According to another verse, Galatians 5.21 says, first the cowards, then the faint-hearted are listed, meaning those who purposely avoid the struggle in the heavenly realm and succumb to the evil powers that prevents them from having intimate communion with Jesus. Then the faithless, those who doubt and possess, due to their doubt, they possess an earth-centered life, which prevents them from changing into like Christ here, and it keeps them off a path of growing into spiritual maturity. So that faithless group, they've got their focus on their earthly life. They're not looking to build the kingdom to come. They're focused on building this one. They've got their resources and their plans and all things focused here. That group, he also issues this warning to. They have not matured. They won't mature, in fact, because their focus is not on the right thing. It's on the wrong kingdom, for one. Um, one who is genuinely a follower of Christ will automatically be focused on heaven and not this earth because we know that we are travelers here. This is not our home. The polluted, the murderers, and the fornicators. Now, the fornicators are any sex outside of the, the agreed-upon marriage that God allows. So fornicators are people having sex outside of that, any kind of sex. Doesn't matter. We're not going to get into which kinds of sex because there's many. 
but any kind of sexual activity outside of what the Bible calls acceptable to God, a man and a woman married is a fornicator, according to the Bible, are those who fell victim to the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places while the sorcerers and idolaters were in contact, well, they stay in contact with spirits from Hades. The last group in this list are the liars, and these are the spiritual offspring of the father of lies. They are directly inspired by the devil. Among them are those who are engaged in witchcraft, occultism, and many do not realize that religion is oftentimes witchcraft. Religion is witchcraft, and many forms of it are intended to mimic Christianity, a way to watch those and test them is by the Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is either present or it's not. So you'll be able to tell by which Spirit is present. And if you look at the fruits of the Holy Spirit, you can tell if it's the Holy Spirit. If it's not that, it's a different Spirit. So then it would be something that would fall under a much more wicked spirit. Don't ever think that someone can be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, not possess the fruits of the Holy Spirit and something's okay. That is not okay. Something is very wrong with that. So they should be warned and they should be helped towards the truth before the end because the end is going to be a very bad place and time to find out that it was not the holy spirit that was governing their faith many sadly fall into this category because if the holy spirit is governing your faith you are eyes on christ you are will you are willed to please jesus and your purpose your whole um, everything about your life um, is le leans to Jesus Christ because that's what the Holy Spirit does. If the spirit that's in you is not doing that, you've got a false spirit in you of some kind. There's no emptiness. Something is on the throne. If it's not worshiping Jesus Christ in, in action, in how it talks, walks, looks, lives, fulfilling its earthly purpose, I would be racing to someone to help me dethrone whatever spirit is operating in my life because many, many of them are mimics, religious spirits, and people honestly believe that they are in the faith and they are not. Their end, sadly, according to the Bible, is in the lake of fire. And the reason I'm speaking on this is out of, is, is a warning so that you have it before you end up there. Again, I always tell people I speak because I was a person just steeped in wickedness. And I came so close to death, well, many times, but one time within seconds and if not for a miracle, I would be there 31 years now next month. Well, in two weeks, actually. It would appear the Bible has very little to say about being a coward. Some translations don't even contain the word, while others it's found once, Revelations 21.8. Other translations use the word fearful in the place of cowardly. In the Greek, the word translated cowardly in Revelations 21.8 implies fearfulness and timidity. The dictionary also confines, defines coward as someone who lacks the courage to do difficult, dangerous, or unpleasant things. A coward consciously avoids unpleasant situations, doing whatever they can to save themselves and what interests them, thereby tethering themselves to fear which thereby tethers them to Satan. Cowardice is sometimes linked to a guilty conscience. Proverbs 21.8, the wicked flee though no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. 
The Bible has much to say about being a slave to fear and contains stories of some godly people who gave in to fear and some much, um, some very powerful lessons to be learned. Um, there's, in fact, quite a few lessons to be learned on this. Cowards tend to be lazy. God detests laziness. If there's anything about, um, don't support laziness in any way. Um, never, never become part of a system that supports laziness. God hates laziness. Cowards tend to exploit and abuse the weak, and God detests exploitation and abuse. Coward, or God loves the courageous, the ones who are not afraid to stand up for truth and justice, even if it means they're going to be persecuted or constantly intimidated. And such attributes are, well, it's not popular to be cowardly, but the bottom line is God detests cowards. God's people can be cowards. Sadly, too often, God did not fail them. They failed God. But he loves those that are slow to anger and those who are slow to violence. That's wisdom. They act after careful thinking and they make the right choice with great dignity. It can be easy to confuse wisdom and strategy for cowardice. God knows. So for those who do that, there is great wisdom in being very cautious. I'm one who's learned to do that the hard way. God loves the courageous. Sometimes that does not mean a sudden response, however. Peter is a good example of a Bible story of cowardice. Peter's three-time denial of Jesus to save his own life revealed a fear that was still surrendered to men rather than to God. And later during the time of the early church, Peter once again decided to refrain from eating with the Gentiles out of a fear for a certain party. His fear of being criticized by his Jewish brothers kept him from obeying God, who had commanded him to accept the Gentiles into the community of believers. In spite of his cowardice on occasion, two very significant occasions, Jesus loved him and continued to call him a disciple. Jesus could see Peter. With Jesus' forgiveness and the gift of healing by the Holy Spirit, Peter went on to live a faith a life of great faith and boldness despite facing serious persecution. And Peter, in the end, was martyred. He was hung, he was crucified on a cross, and he chose to be crucified upside down because he said he did not deserve to be crucified the way Jesus was. So he was martyred upside down. So Peter definitely, Jesus could see. The thing about Jesus is he can see past all of our tremendous failures with, against him. However, you have a responsibility to come forward and keep walking with Jesus to work that out. You can't just stay outside the... Peter stayed very close with Jesus, even after his failures. There are numerous places in the Bible where God tells his people to be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or afraid, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is a command. It is not a suggestion. God um, can expect us not to live in fear because he has given us many promises, as many as there are days in a year, in fact, that he will strengthen us and be with us, that his power and presence are ours for the asking. And when we are enslaving ourselves to fear because we do not believe his word, take his word seriously, we do not believe he is actually with us or will strengthen us or sees us or loves us or knows us, we're choosing to be a coward because at any one of those levels, we're in the sin of unbelief. We're choosing to say, I see that's in the Bible, but I do not believe it. So you're choosing to walk in unbelief, which is just as damaging. While it is natural to experience fear, we're commanded not to let fear control us. Instead, we're to cry out to God because he has promised many times to be there and help us in our time of need. Jesus is our best example of facing fear without letting it control or keep him from obeying God. And if we are born again, we do not have to fear the condemnation mentioned in Revelation 21.8.
However, the statement that cowards will be sent to the lake of fire reminds us that fearful living is not the mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ. We must come to God with our fears, asking him to work out his perfect peace within us because he has provided everything necessary to do that. And if we choose to continue to keep the fear over letting it go to the one who gave his life so we could be free of it, that's the choice that's going to end up being costly. He wants us to ask. He will not let us down, but we have to ask and we have to follow through with it. He followed through with the solution. We have got to follow through also. Nehemiah labels fear as sin. Romans 14, 23 says the same of unbelief. But he who doubts, so doesn't think any of this fits them for some reason, is condemned. He's condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. A lack of faith is also sin. So why are they beginning at the list of Revelation 21 8? Why is the fearful people at the beginning? And of the two, why uh, fearful and there's two, the cowards. The 1996 New Living Translation of the Bible gives an answer to that question. It says, but cowards who turn away from me. In fear, cowards run from the battle. They show their disloyalty to their sovereign. In the spirit realm, they put their self-interest above everything, including God. Fear violates the first commandment by not giving God the first consideration in all things. It is not surprising then that the, sin, the first sin listed is the one that, is, that so directly violates the first and great commandment. In his commentary on Revelation 21.8, James Burton Kaufman notes, but it is not of natural fear and timidity that John speaks. It is that cowardness, which is the last resort, which in the last resort chooses self and safety over Jesus Christ. He nails the core problem of that fear at the end. It can cause us to reject God to favor ourself. It's that kind of cowardice. When the Lord Jesus came to do his work 2000 years ago on earth, Believers in Judaism were too afraid of suffering persecution to follow Jesus. At that time, Judaism was a lawful religion which the government permitted, and people within Judaism believed in God only in name, and they were not persecuted if they kept the name God. But they were not the ones who obeyed the will of God. They, sur they weren't going to take it that far. They didn't want to be persecuted. So they were not approved by God. They were condemned as evildoers and they were ultimately rejected by the Lord. A coward will not take risk for God. The Bible speaks of the bondservant in Jesus' parable who said, I was afraid and went away and buried your talent in the ground. The owner of that slave was so upset. You wicked, lazy slave. You know how I am that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. You should have put my money in the bank, and on my return I would have received it back with interest. The master turned to the other servants. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents, and cast that worthless slave into outer darkness, in that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty-five, fourteen to 30 is that parable. Even in the parables, cowards are not appreciated. From the beginning to the end, the Bible says that only acting by faith pleases God. By its very nature, faith means taking risks. It means acting on what you know to be true, but without complete information. You don't really have any guarantees. You don't even have often enough resources or full approval of everyone. You are acting in faith. To act in faith means there are negatives of one type or another, but the person of faith decides the strong positives of obeying God outweigh them all. A person of faith believes in God, but may still have questions or occasional doubt. Such a one has simply decided to act on the faith they have rather than waiting until all their doubts are worked out. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11:6. 6. 
2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight, and the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2, 4, Romans 1, 17, and Galatians 3, 11. Here's a few interesting points from the Bible concerning cowards, according to Joe McKeever. One, in olden times, cowards were allowed to leave battles and return home. Deuteronomy 21 says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and people more numerous than yourselves, do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt is with you. Even the warriors were required to exercise their faith. Then when you near the battle, the priest will say to the army, you are approaching your enemies today. Do not be faint hearted. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. Then the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Who is the man who is afraid and faint-hearted? Let him depart, return to his house, so that he might not make his brother's hearts melt like his heart. So you have to wonder if anyone actually took the officers up on this and turned around and went home before the battle. Imagine them walking into their home a few hours later saying, Well, the good news is all the cowards got sent home, so here I am. Fear is contagious. Con cowardice feeds upon the fears of others of like minds. Numbers 13, 25 will give you a case study of it spreading like wildfire. When God is calling people to act, he's not, he is not pleased by our indecision, but by our placing more weight with the numbers of the enemy than his presence among us. And we recall the man of God telling his servant in 2 Kings 6, 16, those with us are more than those with them. Only eyes of faith see that. Only of people of faith know this because we consider and know what is represented in the spirit realm that is constantly at our disposal. I had a, a I was speaking a couple years ago to a, a group and one of the men that was in the audience, he came up to me later and he said that, he had to share with me something that God spoke to him when I, when I was speaking. And he said, God said to go tell her where she goes, my army goes with her. And I said, will you please um, put that in an email to me? Just because I battle fear. At that time especially, I was having a real struggle. And I said, I really need to be able to see it. I need to see it. I see things. That's when things really... I needed to see it so he sent it to me in an email and I and I think of it often because it's been one of the you could not send me a gift of money that would mean more to me than that did that God telling him to tell me tell her where she goes my army goes with her the second one God demands that his spokesperson be bold and confident nothing less is gonna do you have been appointed as God's personal representative now get over your stuttering, stand up straight, keep, speak out clearly, keep telling yourself, this is not about me, I am the messenger. The young Jeremiah was protesting, Lord, are you sure? You want me to stand before kings and magistrates and priests and princes? Are you aware who you are talking to here, God? Jeremiah 1.6, then I said, alas, Lord God, I do not know how to speak because I'm a youth. The Lord said, do not say I am a youth. Everywhere I send you, you shall go, and I will command you, and you will speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now gird up your loins and arise, and speak to them, all of which I command you. Do not be dismayed before them, lest I dismay you before them. Now behold, I have made you today as a fortified city, and a pillar of iron, and as walls of bronze. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. That is awesome stuff. God wants no timid spokespeople, no hesitating preachers standing before the bullying Pharaoh, self-righteous ministers all over this world. He doesn't want any timid people being trumpet callers 
for troops into battle. He does not want any timidity out here on the battlefield. I promise you he has absolutely crushed me to get that out of me. Number three, scripture specifically excludes cowards in heaven. It does. Nothing settles the matter of timidity and cowardice more eloquently than the eighth verse of Revelation 21. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all the liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, leading the sad parade of which includes murderers and the sexually immoral will be the cowards. Those will be those timid souls who were afraid to do the right thing. They had feared what people would say if they confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, so they kept it quiet. They kept it quiet at work. They kept it quiet everywhere. They kept it quiet. They didn't want any reactions to that. They just didn't want to have to deal with all that. They had feared what living for Jesus Christ would do to their job, their social standing, and their bank accounts. So they did nothing. They feared being disinherited, that making mother unhappy by committing their lives to Jesus Christ would cost them something here. Remember, this life is a vapor and this money is not going with you. Family considerations come first and now they have eternity, eternity, forever to regret that unwise choice. They had feared embarrassment if they joined a church and humiliation if they were baptized by immersion. Many will not even go to a different church because they fear the family wrath. So they won't go to a church where they can grow and be fed. They won't leave a denomination. They just choose to serve under the same religious devil that the family has always served of. And only when they meet Jesus are they going to realize who they really were serving. It was not Jesus. So they played it safe and they did nothing. They had feared being proven wrong by some professor who had degrees covering his walls, so they did nothing. They lived their lives by fear and they always looked for a safe place to be. They stayed out of all the, the conversations where Jesus is being discussed in terrible ways. Didn't want to have to be in that. They stayed quiet. And they now have all eternity to live with the consequences of that. And nothing is sadder than the fate of cowards. To act by faith means to do the difficult thing because you will never have to do what Jesus did for you. In urging boldness for God's people, I feel a need to point out that there's a fleshly kind of boldness, one that is not from the Holy Spirit. This fleshly boldness is offensive, it's repulsive. Oftentimes it's driven by power or greed. It drives people away from the church, from the gospel, and from Jesus. It brutalizes, it embarrasses, it harasses, it leaves people bleeding in its wake. The offender receives the scorn as proof that he's a man of God, a man of the faith willing to bear the shame of the cross the spiritual boldness that motivated that is motivated by the Holy Spirit lifts up Jesus, makes Jesus attractive to people because he is, and it draws them to Jesus Christ, not to the man. Spiritual boldness is not about humiliating the audience, not about destroying the opposition, and not about puffing up the ego of the preacher not drawing attention to a specific church, a specific pastor, a specific ministry. It should never, ever, ever be about that. If you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, you have one mission. Draw attention to Jesus Christ. That's it. Nothing else. If someone is building something else besides Jesus, and drawing people to something else other than Jesus Christ. The Bible calls them false. It says a lot of things about that, in fact. It does not promise a very good outcome for that. 
because it is um, using what is meant. It is using the name of Jesus as a banner to exalt wickedness and to exalt the plan of man and the consequences are going to be horrendous for those who willfully participated. We see spirit-powered boldness on display through the book of Acts and nowhere more than chapter 4. After being threatened and warned to quit preaching about Jesus, the early believers got together for prayer time in which they committed their situation to Jesus and then they prayed. The place where they were gathered was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Before leaving this point, I want to um, describe what fleshly carnal boldness in preachers looks like. Ego is the driver. The emphasis is on the externals, the appearance, the showmanship, and the symbols of success. People are either drawn to or repulsed by this preacher, depending on the spirit that they are operating from. His sermons are loaded with references and stories of himself. When he talks, he speaks about himself. His publications glorify his successes. One thing they don't talk about are his failures. They don't mention that. I don't say just him, there's hers too. Women and men alike in this. No one truly representing the kingdom of God should ever be promoting self in any way out here in their calling. There should be no advancement of career done at the expense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The true Holy Spirit kind of boldness that hates this stuff, hates it, but says instead, he must increase, I must decrease. The minister who is genuinely working for Jesus, not only will the fruit be there, but this minister has long given up any ambitions for a ministry career with its constant emphasis, emphasis on self-advancement. He has no desire for something higher, something better, a better seat, a better salary, a better anything. He is not looking for that. He does not care if his name gets out anywhere. He's not attaching his name to things. He is exalting Jesus Christ. He has a call from the Most High, and he's going to fulfill that call. He is a faithful, faithful servant. God has not given us the spirit of fear or timidity, but of Holy Spirit power, of love for all people. It's incredible to see it in operation, but it's sad to see how few actually do it. Another argument that's often brought up is, in the context of this whole subject is, if God is love and he loves us all, how can he live knowing that millions of people are going to burn in hell forever over this one little thing? This is a common thing. And honestly, when this question is usually asked over whatever variety of question they're, or sin they're concerned about, that person isn't someone who's really trying to forsake their sin and surrender to Jesus. I've not yet met anyone in that category that asks this question. But here's the answer to that, because I know many people wonder. God is God. He is the creator, and he gets to do what he wants with his creation. The fact that he lays out the situation that we're in with its terms and conditions obtaining the best possible outcome for us that makes us royalty forever and ever and ever in a kingdom with him and then gives us the option, take it or leave it, makes this a really foolish argument to have with someone. It's like saying, I don't think the lion has a right to be a lion, so I'm going to poke a stick in its eye. That's how foolish it is. In the Bible, 
It is called in one place, the second death. You're alive now because you had a first birth, but you will die. And after this, whatever awaits us is gonna happen. It'll be there just as naturally, whether you wanna believe it or not, it's gonna be there the same as if whatever you think about. Whatever is after this life will happen. Your belief isn't going to change it. You cannot create it. You cannot destroy it. All you can do is do your best to prepare for it. It gives me no pleasure to consider that many will hear me and will fire a whole bunch of crazy at me. I just prayed in advance that they wouldn't do it while I was speaking. <laughs> but it does really bother me that people are so they don't care enough to even try to consider that what eternity how long that is to be in such a terrible place i do believe that it's very wise to attempt to do whatever it is to have fire insurance against eternity but that is not faith the true goal of christianity has been portrayed as an attempt to rescue those lost from hell for eternity and as concerning as hell is this portrayal is completely wrong the true goal of christianity according to jesus is reconciliation with god his father everything else falls into place from there but saving people from hell was never the goal of anything that was supposed to happen. It was reconciliation with our Father in heaven. The love of God, there, there shouldn't even have to be conversations about, do I want to go to hell? Do I not want to go to hell? Who's going to go to hell? Why would God send anyone to hell? Those conversations shouldn't even be had because he has made a way for you not to go there. You should just take it. It's that simple. The love of God is not dependent on the lovable traits of man, by the way. If it were a prerequisite, God doesn't have to love any of us. Rather, love is an attribute of God himself. It's a character trait of his. The New Testament was originally written in Greek, and unlike a single word of love in English, the Greek language has had several words to describe different kinds of love, and the Greek word used about the regarding the love of God is agape and agape is a love that values the recipient of the love regardless of their merit that's good news for a lot of us <laughs> because we know what that means for us because we really knew we didn't deserve love from God and in the case of God at least the value of the receiver is elevated because of the one who loves them. So our value is based on his value for us, not anything about us, not how ridiculously terrible we have been or how amazingly perfect somebody may have been. It doesn't matter. It is the value comes from him. So it's about who it's coming from, not the condition of the one that's being loved. Everyone gets the same value. If in the case of like a human standpoint, if you're, um, if you're a human, uh, just a normal everyday human like myself, and then the king comes to town and he comes through and he picks one of the fine ladies in this room who all are common, like me, we're just normal human beings. Well, we're not that normal, but we're kind of normal. Suddenly, in the Earth's terms, if this is like, say, the king of a country, this one suddenly becomes incredibly more important on the world front. She's got a lot more value. She's probably going to get quite a few people around her. The value change, not because of anything about her, it's who picked her. That's where that value suddenly jumped way up. And that's in our case. That's the same. It's because God places that value on us. It comes from him. God's love does not negate justice, however. He described himself to Moses as one who is patient, long-suffering, and full of kindness, but who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. 
a just judge would have to sentence even his own son if his son violated the law. If he didn't, he would be a corrupt judge. A just judge cannot leave the guilty unpunished and remain just, but he can pay the required fine for them. The wrath and judgment of God against sin remains on the heads of sinners and all humans are sinners with an eternal death penalty on their heads. But God's law includes a provision for a substitute to pay the penalty on behalf of the sinner and Jesus is that substitute. Because of his infinite worth to God, he was sufficient payment for all of the sins of all men and women for all time because he was the only thing that mattered to God. Jesus was his son, his only son. So this isn't a free pass. There's provisions in the law for pardon and the terms and conditions for pardon are outlined in the Bible and marked by a changed life, a fullness of the Holy Spirit. We have to be sealed for heaven. Those who refuse the terms of the pardon remain under the sentence of eternal death, not because God doesn't love them, but they do not love God enough to submit to the provision he made for them. And I hope that's clear because there's a lot of like, lack of looking into it, but people who just make these blanket assumptions about God that they think somehow is going to sort out in the end, but it's very clear and it will sort out in the end. And in the end, you'll understand it. And you'll be like, I wish somebody would have said that. Christians will give all sorts of spiritual excuses as to why they are cowards and why they are going to remain a coward. Examples, for example, from the Bible would look like this. For the fiery furnace, they will say, I will fall down before the idol, but in my heart, I'm praying to God. Before the lion's den, it is God's will that I must pray in secret from now on. That once that whole lion's den thing comes up, he, God wants me to pray in secret. Before Goliath, they will say, I will pray that God will send his mighty angel to defeat Goliath. That's how cowards would have played out those scenes. God can give you strength, Luke 24, 49, but it is we who have to trust in him fully and be courageous. And with choosing, he says often that he has courage for us. We have to take it. Therefore, it's not just dumped out on us. We have to ask. We have to take it. Those choosing to be cowards don't realize this. They have no faith. And what's waiting for them is a lake of fire for all eternity. A pastor once shared this story. There was a severe drought with no sign of any rain. On a hot day, Christians in a village were called to the church to pray for rain. But only one little boy came to that prayer meeting and he came with an umbrella. And as James said, faith without works is dead. Just as a little boy came to church with an umbrella, God is expecting us to be like that little boy, trusting him for everything. The rest who are cowards will find themselves in a lake of fire. He says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Um, Sean Brazo says in his writing, who are the fearful in Revelation 21.8? Here's what he says, but they did not want to become his spiritual people through Christ because then they would be ridiculed by sinful men. They did not want to confess Jesus Christ before men. They denied him. How they did this, looking back at Daniel's 70th week, they accepted the Antichrist and his mark and worshiped the image. Jesus had warned in Matthew chapter 10, whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, him also I him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. And this is spoken in view of his second coming, which is his return to destroy the Antichrist and his followers. The deniers will not overcome because they will not 
believe that Jesus is Christ. They will simply reject God's truth. They will fall for Satan's lie and believe the Antichrist is the true Christ in the end. Facing death, they will choose the Antichrist over Jesus Christ. Because the delusion comes when they will rather keep their wealth, their friends, and their prestige than trust Jesus Christ and make a public profession in rejecting the Antichrist. Frankly, they will be cowards. 1 John chapter 5, especially verse 5, holds the key to Israel's overcoming the evil world system present during the end times. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves him, that loves him also, and loves him that is also begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep his commandments. Remember, the first one is that we love him more than all other things. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. By believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the overcomers will not be fooled into thinking that the Antichrist is the real Messiah. And that's what happens at the end. Their faith is what prevents them from falling into deception. Those who are fearful, however, that are too timid to take a stand, they will cave into the peer pressure and they will refuse in the end to have faith in Jesus Christ. They will naturally fall for the Antichrist because of their fear. That's how they fall. And this is a serious warning for many because we're heading into those times right now. And if that's the way you are now, that's, this is a serious warning. You have to have the courage to stand for Jesus Christ and his words in any situation at this point because we're moving into the time where all of those situations are starting to rise. We know it. Some people don't want to hear it. They tell me that. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to blah, blah, blah. But I'm telling you that those of us who got our ear to the wind of this stuff, we know that these days are here. I just, I am urgent. I'm urgent that the truth be told and that as many people as possible become saved. You're always welcome to reach out to us. Um, I, my passion is leading people to Christ, bringing them to freedom from bondage. That is my passion. That's what I will spend the rest of my earthly life doing, as far as I know. <laughs> um, I, I'm just deeply grateful to Jesus for saving me from hell. This would have been the least of things that would have sent me to hell. But I don't want anyone to take... Um, chances anymore because we're watching death happen faster and more regularly than I've ever seen it. It's crazy times. It's hard to understand this, but we're in crazy times whether people want to believe it or not. We're in a whole different time now. And I want people not to just choose, not to just clean this up for their own self for eternity, but to really jump into the battle and let's build heaven before it's too late there's so many that don't know jesus many of them are sitting in the church i talked to one yesterday he said i had no idea i thought i was saved all these years i've been in the church all these years he's addicted to drugs that doesn't make him lost any more than wealth or power or any porn any other thing but he just said, I didn't realize that a requirement of salvation is following Jesus. Obedience is a requirement. It's not a, a sort of, I hope you get there. You might someday get to that point. He said, I had no idea. Someone had shared that with him. He was really tormented. He was really tormented. So make sure you know the truth. Walk in it. Hell is forever. Precious Lord, you are so worthy of our worship. 
You are the one who gave up everything. You gave your life. You were beaten unrecognizable. You are the one who deserves. You are the one who deserves worship and not kick back and push back and God help us to not be that kind of a people. Help us to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in all things and say yes Jesus and lay down all rights to ourselves, these terrible rights that we keep to our own life that we're offended by God that he didn't come through for us on something is going to cost us for eternity we have zero rights to ourselves if we are in Christ help us Jesus to get this right before it's too late I pray for revival Jesus start revival in our midst right here I ask that you just start a fire in our midst that just burns brighter than anything in this city has ever burned we want to see you Jesus we want to see you high and lifted up for real we want to see you high and lifted up we want to see the glory come down. We want people to know Jesus Christ is the answer. You touch the hem of his garment, you will be free. I don't care how terribly bound you are. You can be free in a moment. I was. You can turn from the worst thing that is in your town to a voice for the master. I pray that all works of the enemy are bound right now in the lives of anyone who is listening to me, that the voices of the devil are silenced in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that covers every ear that's listening. And I declare, Jesus, have your way, move in, and start a fire. I rebuke the enemy from these lives. I rebuke all the lies that he has told them. Jesus set them free. Set them free in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, evict the enemy from every single life. So quickly they will know, they will know the power of Jesus Christ to save and deliver. break every curse every bondage all generational sin we break all strongholds ties to the enemy we break them in the name of Jesus Christ over every listener and we declare the mighty power of Jesus Christ to rule and reign in their lives give them a glorious glorious presence of you Jesus right now that they will take and run with that will be so life-changing. Start a fire in your people, God. Cause the Christians to get up and fight for you. You are worth fighting for. We need more building this kingdom. So we just speak against all the idols that are in the way of the believers and ask you to destroy them God all the idols destroy them that you would just right now just torpedo the idols blow them up God and give your people a chance to see that Jesus is not Lord of their life so that they can truly bow in surrender and serve you before it's too late. Thank you for every single day you have given me that I do not deserve and for all these precious women you have surrounded me with and men. I do not deserve this life. 
but I thank you for giving me the privilege of being to stand and declare the works of the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.